Welcome to the Valley Regional Forum. I'm Sean McCarthy. And I'm Tony Michaelman. Tony, take it away. Uh, we're speaking today with Matt DeBomney, member of the Assembly 45th District. And thanks for being here today, Matt. Uh, why don't you begin by telling us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for re-election in the Assembly. Well, Tony, Sean, thank you so much for hosting this today. I really appreciate the opportunity to share my views and some of the work I've done in the Assembly the past nine months. Uh, you know, it's been a real honor as a fourth generation Valley resident uh, to serve uh, in the San Fernando Valley's, I think, heartland uh, in the State Assembly. One of the main reasons I ran for public office last year was because I think I've been given great opportunities by this state, by this community, uh, to serve in public service. And I wanted to make sure the next generation of young people had those same opportunities. That's why I've been an advocate for greater funding for public education, especially for our UCs and Cal States, but also for community colleges like Pierce. I've also fought to make sure we're bringing jobs back to the Valley. That's why I was an advocate and a co-author for the film tax credit, which was recently passed, which gives us more of a competitive edge against some of these other states that have been stealing away our production. I've also been an advocate for making sure that I continue the legacy I learned in Congress from Brad Sherman's office of making sure I follow through on the representative part of being a member of the assembly. That's why my office is continually in the community. I'm always available and we're looking to solve problems for residents of the West San Fernando Valley. There are a number of propositions on the, on the ballot. We're going to start with Proposition 1. This is the $7.1 billion water bond uh, to put in two new tunnel bypass tunnels uh, in the Sacramento Delta, build new storage facilities, and protect habitat. Where do you stand on Proposition 1? I strongly support it, and this is something that we worked on uh, very closely in the Budget Committee and with the Governor and the leadership of both sides of the aisle in the Assembly and the Senate. It truly was a bipartisan bill. I believe only one Democrat and one Republican on uh, both sides of the aisle voted against the bill. This is something that really unifies the state. It was a great example of how, you know, just a few years ago when this bill was put forward, originally it was about 11.1 billion and it was full of pork. This year we took out a lot of that extra fluff, really got it down to just the basics, but things that we really need uh, across the state to ensure when we have our next drought, we'll be prepared. So this provides water storage for the Central Valley where we have most of our agricultural communities. It provides not only the food for our state, but for the country. It provides environmental protections for people in the northern part of the state. Here locally, I'm very excited because it provides the resources necessary uh, to clean and recharge our aquifer and groundwater here in the San Fernando Valley, which will mean in the future, more local water to be used by residents, uh, less cost hopefully for water bills. And it also provides money for the LA River cleanup. As many people know, the LA River starts in the San Fernando Valley here in the 45th district. This will provide an opportunity to return the LA River back to its natural state, which has huge implications for our community, both environmentally and also as a place to provide more recreational area. So I'm for it and I hope everyone else will join me in voting for it. Uh, Prop uh, 46, uh, which authorizes the California Insurance Commission to take control of uh, health care cost increases. Mm -hmm. For it? I have not taken a position on that bill right now. I'm on the insurance committee. I do understand why the a state insurance commissioner who's been a friend is uh, looking into this. This is something we had to do with auto insurance uh, several decades ago. We've done with a number of other industries. It's provided more you know, stability in those markets. That being said, I'm still evaluating this position. I'd be happy uh, to put out an official statement when I make a decision. Uh, but we've been so focused on the legislation at hand in a very busy legislative session this year that I haven't taken a formal position on 46. Uh, but I have taken an official position on 47 if you're interested. <laughs> Proposition 46 is a medical malpractice initiative. This is the one that would allow uh, ceilings on medical malpractice claims to yeah. rise from $250,000 yeah. to $1 million. Have you taken a position on that? I have, and I think just to clarify, Prop 45 is the rate reg, and that's what's being pushed by the insurance commissioner, and I will be putting out a position on that shortly. Prop 46 is what we call the micro initiative. Currently, we have a cap on pain and suffering in the state. We have no cap on any other damages when you have malpractice. I'm someone that believes that we need to make sure that we hold doctors accountable like any other profession when there is a gross negligence. But I also believe that we need to make sure that we have a balance to that. Uh, currently, we have a cap on uh, malpractice. Uh, in the future, if that wants to be debated at the legislative level to see if we need to make changes, that's something I'm open to. I'm not for this proposition, though. I think the drastic increase uh, to the over a million dollar mark uh, would cause uh, uncertainty and a lack of access and affordability in our healthcare system. I also think that drug testing doctors is something that we need to put more thought into and probably debate more at the legislative level than put in a proposition. 
Uh, you know, I've talked to victims of malpractice. My heart goes out to them. I think that we need to make sure that they are provided justice. But I also need to look into this and think it's something that the legislators should look at in the future. Because frankly, right now, uh, the timing couldn't be worse. We're having a new situation where we're trying to add millions of people in the state uh, to our insured roles. That means we're going to need to provide more access to health care. It means we're going to have to bring costs down. Almost every independent study, and really, if you look at other states that have increased their cap or don't have a cap on uh, pain and suffering, uh, they cause great problems in access and in affordability of health care. Uh, that's why you look at the coalition that's against this proposition. It's not just doctors, it's labor unions, it's Planned Parenthood, it's community clinics, it's hospitals, it's people that really understand that right now we need to do everything we can in our power uh, to encourage savings in health care and then promote access. I don't think this bill does either. I think in the future this is something we could take a look at uh, through a legislative process, uh, but I'm, I'm urging people to vote no on this proposition. Mayor Garcetti uh, has proposed raising the minimum wage to $13.25 an hour. Mm. Do you feel this ultimately will result in more jobs or less jobs for the city of Los Angeles? Well, you know, I, I'm still looking at Mayor Garcetti's proposal. This is relatively new. I know that in this legislative session, we raised the minimum wage. I think this July 1st went up to $9.25, I believe. Uh, next year, will go to around $10. I am someone that has said, great faith in the mayor so far. He's done a great job, I think, looking at how we can improve our business climate in the state and the city specifically. You know, I came in with a desire to make sure that uh, we looked at everything that we can do as a legislator and someone that cares about our community to bring jobs back. We also want to make sure that we provide wages to people that allow them to provide for their family. Uh, this is something that's got to be debated and we're going to have to take a look at this. But I will tell you, I'm very proud that we increase minimum wage at the state level, which evens a playing field for everyone. Unfortunately, sometimes when cities pass laws that other cities don't have, uh, that causes um, a kind of a patchwork that allows for companies and businesses to jump around and that can hurt one area or benefit one area at the expense of another. So we have a great example of that with the plastic bag ban recently. You know, we had obviously in the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles a ban for over a year now and that's taken effect. We had it in other cities like San Diego, uh, San Francisco. Uh, and, and multiple jurisdictions, I think over 80 cities and counties across the state had the ban. Unfortunately, this caused a lot of grief in, in the business community because it, it made for uncertainty. It made them have to have multiple different um, products available for different jurisdictions, even if they're across the street from each other. So this year we worked with labor, we worked with uh, the grocery stores, we worked with the business community, uh, and we worked with even those that produce the plastic bags to come up with a bill that we passed to impose a statewide ban on disposable one-time use plastic bags that cause a lot of environmental problems. We've replaced that with uh, now reusable plastic bags and, and, and with an emphasis on people bringing their own bags uh, that causes in a, basically you know, to have one blanket policy for the state. So when we're looking at minimum wage, we're looking at other environmental laws, it's always good to look at it at a state approach to make sure we're not creating winners and losers. But I do think we have to make sure that providing wages that provide people an opportunity to take care of their family and also put an injection of capital back into communities. As far as the state pensions are concerned, we know that they're going crazy. What can you do legislatively? What can be done legally to bring these pensions into yeah. control? Well, I think we've seen already a lot of progress on that. I think the governor's made it a focus. They passed legislation several years ago that starts a process. You know, I do think some of this is um, a little bit of hyperbole. We need to look at how we can make sure municipalities are able to live within their means. I think you've already seen cities and counties throughout the state uh, start looking at what they can afford for pensions, and it starts at the local level. Uh, there's things we're going to have to look at at the legislative level, too. You know, uh, one of my colleagues, Rob Bonta, sits on the committee that oversees pensions. He's got a lot of great ideas. We're working in a bipartisan way to start thinking of how we can make sure the state pays down its long-term unfunded uh, liabilities with pensions. We have a number of uh, new reports showing that this is the first time in years where we're actually creating a new rainy day fund uh, at the state level, which will help pay down some of these unfunded liabilities, especially in the teacher's pension. We're also giving us an actual rainy day fund to tap into when we have an economic downturn. So that's a positive first step. I think like any family, a government has to live within its means. And when we're providing pensions in the future, we have to be able to afford them and have them not come at the expense of other vital services. Uh, but it's gonna take a holistic approach. There's no one solution that's gonna happen overnight. Uh, but I do think that this governor has a focus on that. And the new makeup of this assembly uh, on both sides of the aisle, I think, has a desire to start tackling this issue. Is there a need to move away from carbon fuels? Is the idea of a green economy even feasible? Well, I think even 
those that are against you know basic environmental laws would say that you know in the future we're going to have to move away from carbon fuels because it's just not sustainable. I don't think that's an overnight process. You know, I'm someone that really believed in AB 32 and believes that we should be working to be a leader in this field. We've seen a lot of progress being made. Uh, you know, when you look at the amount of uh, efficiency we get in our vehicles now compared to 20 years ago, it's night and day. Uh, that's something that was also market driven too. If you look at most of the commercials from Ford and GM just a decade ago, they were pushing big SUVs and, and cars that probably got less than 15 miles a gallon uh, of efficiency. Today, if you look at most commercials, they're for the Ford Fusion, they're for smaller, uh, more fuel efficient cars, and in many cases, hybrids. And I think that's a market driven uh, result of people wanting to get uh, more bang for their buck and also wanting to drive smaller cars. Uh, part of that's because of gas prices, but part of that's because I think of an awareness of the environmental concerns. So I think we have to have an approach where we provide more carrots and not just sticks. You know, I'm someone that was a big believer when we had the Castro Clunker bill a few years ago at the federal level. Uh, not just because it stimulated the economy and helped uh, save a major you know, U.S. industry, but because it allowed many people in the, the middle and, and lower middle classes uh, to afford a new car by trading in a car that probably was less efficient and, and gave them an opportunity to be able to save money on fuel costs, drive a car that was less of a pollutant. And I think those are the type of approaches we need to take, providing people more public transportation, providing people more incentives to buy hybrid and fuel efficient cars. Also, you know, getting out of the way of business sometimes and letting them determine how they can best serve these new uh, constituencies by allowing them to take the technology and use it to make market-driven solutions like we've seen with more hybrid cars being available. And, uh, and, and sometimes I think that the thing that sometimes on my side of the aisle uh, that we forget is that not everyone can afford a Prius or, or a Tesla. Not everyone has great options for public transportation. You know, I'm a big believer that we need to start working, uh, and we have been, but continue the progress to get off of carbon and fossil fuels in the future and look for alternatives. But at the same time, I don't think we can punish people or treat fossil fuels like nicotine and just tax them to a point where people don't have any other options and they can't afford uh, to feed their family and fill their tank. I think we need to look for more carrots to go along with some of these sticks. Cap and trade goes into effect, at least as far as the consumer is concerned, January 1st. We all get a 15 cent increase in gasoline as a part of the a cap and trade fees. Does this mean an end to transportation bonds? Will be will we be looking exclusively to cap and trade to pay for public transportation, road improvements, and and, and related? Well, issues? I think there'll be a new component. We've already seen that. And in terms of you know the high speed rail project, uh, you know my focus there is really to make sure that we look at how we can use this as a regional connectivity issue. You know the idea of going from LA to San Francisco might appeal to some. I think Southwest Airlines is a great alternative for that. But when you talk about the idea that you could get from LA to San Diego or LA to Orange County or Riverside to Santa Barbara, all places you can't fly on a Southwest airline, uh, but it will take you two or three hours in traffic to get there. People get really excited because it opens up where people can live and work. It opens up new kind of uh, regions for commerce. Uh, the idea that you could get on a high speed rail in the valley and get to Orange County in 30 minutes and go to Disneyland is something I think it would appeal to a lot of people, especially if you need to get from LA to Riverside or LA to Orange County for a job or, uh, where you're now sitting on the freeway two or three hours and spending you know, hundreds of dollars of gas every month. Uh, so those are would be my focus in regional transportation. In terms of bonds, I think we're always going to have a place for bonds. Uh, we're going to need them at the city and, and county level to uh, fund projects that we don't want to uh, wait for the state to be involved in. Uh, we're going to have to have a more holistic approach. As you know, some of the consequences of having more fuel efficient cars and driving less is that we're receiving less into the gas tax fund. But we really have to start thinking outside the box to see how we can use all these funds efficiently, being good stewards of taxpayer dollars, but also we, we can't rely on some of the mechanisms of the past because we have a changing economy and we also have changing behaviors in transportation. What should we do about Prop 13? Keep it as it is, modify it, eliminate it? What do you think? I'm a strong supporter of Prop 13. I believe it's been a backbone principle of people in the San Fernando Valley and across the state being able to afford uh, their home. I know personally I wouldn't have been able to afford my home without knowing that my property taxes would be stable. I also believe we need to protect it for businesses, uh, especially for small businesses throughout the state. Uh, we need to make sure they have stability as well. Uh, I know there's a lot of talk that it's under attack in Sacramento. It truly is not. Uh, there's a large coalition of people on both sides of the aisle that are for protecting Prop 13 and believe it's a core principle of making sure that homeowners are able to afford uh, their houses, especially as they become seniors. Uh, there is a, an opportunity, I think, in the future to maybe prevent uh, big corporations uh, from taking advantage of Prop 13 and taking 
uh, you know, these kind of loopholes that no homeowner or small business would be able to do. Uh, we saw an example of that at the Fairmont Hotel, uh, where it was sold to a big corporation. Uh, they split it up among five or six uh, shell entities and didn't have to increase their property tax share, even though the building uh, was based on a property tax that was about 20 to 30 years old. So I think we need to look at small loopholes like that that close uh, the ability for corporations that aren't paying their fair share. But that being said, in terms of homeowners, small business, I'm a strong supporter. I'll fight to prevent split roll, and I'll fight to make sure that we always try to keep uh, homes affordable in the San Fernando Valley and protect homeowners in that regard. And Matt, with the last couple of minutes that we have, uh, tell us uh, a little bit wh why we should be voting for you and how, where your campaign is at this Well, point. you know, I really appreciate uh, you guys taking the time to do this interview today and, and to have people thoughtfully engaged in these issues in our community is part of the reason what makes the San Fernando Valley so great. It really is an honor to serve. You know, my great-grandfather moved to the San Fernando Valley in the 1920s from Iowa to find a better life for his family. He uh, had a young family, he couldn't find work in Iowa, and he ended up migrating west uh, and ended up working at what is now UCLA as a laborer and a bricklayer. Some 80 years later, I was very fortunate to graduate from that same school. And it's not lost on me that my success in life and, and what I'm able to achieve in life uh, will be determined by a lot of the things I was able to get as a student and a lot of the benefits and resources I was able to get from this great state. So my goal in the assembly for the last nine months and going forward will be to make sure I'm able to help create those opportunities where I can uh, for other people. In education, where we're providing more resources for our UCs, our Cal States, and our community colleges. To make sure more students here in the state are able to afford a college education and choose possibly a career in public service. Uh, we also are looking at ways to improve our economy, to provide more opportunities for people to start a business, to grow a business, to hire more people, and to really live the American dream. That's why I'm so excited about passing the film tax credit. Uh, we also passed aerospace tax credits this year to help bring another industry back to the valley in the state. Uh, we're looking at ways to cut regulation and to make it easier for people to grow their business here in the state. We've seen the job numbers come up. We have a long way to go. We have a lot more work to do to make the state more business competitive, but I feel like we're going in the right direction. We also this year passed an on-time budget. As a member of the Budget Committee, I was very proud to be an advocate for creating a rainy day fund. So going forward, we have a proposition on the ballot, uh, Prop 2, that will allow the voters to make the, it's the law of the land that for every year going forward, we take 1.5% of the budget, put in the rainy day fund. Half of that will go to pay off our long-term debt. Half of that will be stored away and can only be taken out for a natural disaster like the Northridge earthquake or when we have a, a, an economic downturn. And that way we don't have to raise taxes or cut services when we have the next recession. So I'm very proud of the record we have in Sacramento. I'm very proud to have the support of Congressman Brad Sherman, Governor Jerry Brown, uh, the number of business community leaders that are the big job providers in the state, uh, Howard Keyes of Keyes Motors, Sid Leibovich Rodeo Realty. Uh, we have a lot of grassroots support as well from across the valley. I ask people for their vote again because I want to humbly go back to Sacramento and serve uh, in my hometown here in the San Fernando Valley. I really believe that this state is the greatest state in the country. We have a long way to go to get back to where we need to be in a number of issues, but I truly believe we're on the right track and I look forward to serving uh, for another term. Wonderful. Matt, thank Thanks you very so much. much for joining us today. Thanks, Matt. Good and luck. Best of luck to you. Thank you. Thank you.